Welcome to How Ecology Works. In this podcast, we cover all topics in ecology and how you might apply them in your future career. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to How Ecology Works. Today, I have Dr. David Coyle here and is an expert with invasive species. And, and uh, judging by your work, you've worked with, with uh, quite a few plant and animal and insect species uh, in the past. So I'd love for you to tell us a little more about your program. What is an invasive species? How does that affect biodiversity as a whole? And maybe some interesting uh, observations that you've made from your own program over the years. Hey, Marcus, thanks for having me. Yeah, we work with a lot of different invasives up here, everything from insects to fungus to, uh, to plants. So it's, it's very diverse. Um, you know, we talked a little earlier, my appointment is 100% extension. So I work with all sorts of different clients, everything from landowners to uh, private citizens to you know, state and government agencies. Invasive species are a big deal. They, they have a lot of impact economically, ecologically. Uh, for some of these invasives, there's a lot of federal or state regulations that come along with them. So there's a lot that people need to be aware of. So invasive species is one of those terms that can be confusing. It seems like it might not be, but it can be. We have native species. Uh, and when we talk about native, it just means it's from here. And I always think of here being on a continent scale. If something is from North America, it's native to North America. I use a continent scale because, you know, what about things that live on the, you know, the Texas border and they just happen to float across the river into Mexico? Are they really invading or do they just happen to float across the river? It's just a, a natural expansion, right? So I always look at it on a continent scale. So you have native species, you have, and then you have species that are not native and those can either be called non-native or alien species or exotic species. All of those things mean the same thing. It just simply means that that particular organism is not from that continent. Now, invasive species are just a subset of things not from that continent. Uh, invasive species are, they're all alien species, they're not native species, they're exotic species, but they have a couple characteristics that sort of set them apart. They have, uh, uh, they cause a lot of economic or ecological damage. That's one of the big, uh, you know, triggers for what makes it an invasive species is it causing lots of damage. And then they also have some behavioral and just, you know, biological characteristics that make them very apt to take over areas and to sort of kick out native species. Um, one of the things we tend to think about with invasive species is, you know, the big thing that always comes to mind is the economic impact or the, uh, the loss of timber, for instance, right? Emerald ash borer is kind of our case study, our poster child for what is a really bad invasive forest pest. And this is not from here, right? It's native to China. And it has killed, you know, millions of ash trees in the eastern part of the continent. Uh, very little signs of slowing down. The only thing that stopped it is basically the Great Plains because there aren't many trees out there, right? So it, it pretty much mowed through all the ash in the eastern part of the continent. You know, that said, we have all sorts of non-native beetles in, in this part of the world, right? You can go and set a, a trap for ambrosia beetles outside your house right now, and you'll probably get a dozen different species that are non-native, but they're not invasive, right? We know very little about them. They just, you know, once they get here, they just kind of assimilate into the rest of everything there. So from an economic perspective, we call them, you know, just simply non-natives or exotics. Now, one of the big questions is the biodiversity question. What is happening with some of these non-native pests when it comes to biodiversity? It's really tough to really look at what happens with insects, for instance. Okay, and here's where we're gonna have, there's a lot of differences between non-native and invasive insects and non-native and invasive plants. Plants are fairly simple uh, in, in terms of this because they don't move, right? So you can see a patch of, you know, an invasive kogan grass patch get bigger over time. And that is one of those really bad ones that is gonna just take over an area. You can physically see it has kicked everything else out. It grows faster, it grows thicker, and, and nothing else grows in a big kogan grass patch. So you can clearly see and measure that it has knocked out or displaced invasive uh, native species, 
it's much more difficult to do that with something like an ambrosia beetle, because how do you know that it's really taken over, uh, you know, habitat that native ambrosia beetles would be in? You don't have that before and after like you can have with plants, right? You can't, it's a lot tougher to measure. And, you know, we've, we've talked about going into some of the museum specimens and, well, let's look, you know, 50 years ago versus today. Well, that works if if they were actually catching those things, you know, and I mean, were they trying to catch those and, you know, by and large from the insect world, the smaller the thing, the less it gets captured. Just, you know, people like the big butterflies, right? So there's all sorts of records of butterflies everywhere, right? But these little, you know, beetles that are a millimeter long, there's not many people that are going to collect those. It's a very sort of niche market, if you will. So, so we honestly don't know what a lot of these non-native insect pests are doing to the biology around us. We know they're there. We suspect some things are happening, but we really don't have a lot of, a lot of evidence at this point. And there's some folks that are starting to work out, you know, trying to figure out what they do and, and how they're doing it, but it's a, it's a tricky, tricky situation at this point. Yeah, it's really interesting. So uh, with some of these species that you're talking about, I know you mentioned Kogon grass invading and essentially eliminating the native plants in that environment. Are there consistent traits, maybe across invasive plants or maybe even across invasive species that make them particularly problematic? Like are there a set of species that when they invade, they are really good at eliminating all the others or is that something that's just specific to plants and not other types of invasives? You know it's most often discussed in context of plants but I think the traits kind of carry over to whatever organism you're talking about whether it's a plant or a fungus or a, an insect or a vertebrate right they tend to be extremely adaptable they can grow in a variety of habitats in the case of a plant let's saw kogan grass right it can grow if it's wet dry cool hot, shade, sun, likes fire. I mean, what other environment is there, honestly, that, that it might even encounter? And it thrives in all of them. So they're very adaptable. They have very few natural enemies once they're here. And I think a lot of times people don't give natural enemies the credit they deserve for keeping populations of things in check. Um, they're sort of taken, taken for granted that, oh, you know, a lot of these caterpillar outbreaks we see, right? Forest tent caterpillar, they, they come and go. And people just think, well, they come and go. Well, they go because of all the natural enemies, right? Because there's been that co-evolution throughout the, throughout the years here. And these natural enemies have evolved to take advantage of big populations of native, uh, native pests. When a non-native, whatever it gets to a new area, it does not have those co-evolved natural enemies. And it's just sort of let loose, right? So you've got, you've got that as an issue. You've got a very high reproductive rate, uh, whether it's seeds or, or you know, um, spreading by, by rhizomes or just a high egg production or, or you know, offspring production, high reproductive rate. Um, those are kind of the three big ones. You know, they're adaptable. They make a lot of babies and, uh, you know, they just sort of take over. And that's why some of these, these organisms get here, they may arrive here for whatever reason. You know, a lot of the plants come on purpose. They come because they're a horticultural uh, thing, right? They're pretty, or they, you know, they, they grow somewhere. Um, a lot of the fungal and invertebrate pests are accidental introductions. Uh, and down in Florida, you've got a lot of human introductions, especially in the vertebrate world, right? You got mm -hmm. all the lizards and all that. People get them as pets and let them go. Um, there's, there's a fair number of these things that get out and don't really explode with their populations. And that just sort of tells us that, well, they don't possess all of those characteristics, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not great competitors. Uh, maybe they don't have a really high reproductive rate. Um, maybe they're not that adaptable, right? Maybe they're a little bit fussy on where they live and what they eat and they can't find the right host plant or something. So, um, you know, there's, there's a number of reasons why some things become invasive and others just don't, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, um, I work a lot with USDA APHIS, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and, and I do a lot of work at the, the ports and, and looking at what things come in solid wood packing into the 
into the continent and the country. And it's, it's kind of shocking when you look at the list of interceptions of things that those folks have. They find a lot of stuff all the time. And it stands to reason that a lot of stuff isn't being found, mm -hmm. right? But also, as much stuff is probably not being found, we don't have as many of those great big outbreaks that we have, you know? And thinking from the insect perspective, there was Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer, borer wilt. Before that, you know, you got to go back a ways to Dutch elm disease and chestnut blight. Um, there's the, the shot hole borers in California now, but but there's, there's not that many from a number standpoint that come out and just wreak havoc. Mm -hmm. But the ones that do are just incredibly destructive. And so that's kind of the, the kicker. You know, we put a lot of effort into trying to stop the next big one. But the problem is we don't know what that next big one's going to be. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, something that I find interesting about this topic as well, I, you know, when coming through a degree program that was forestry centric and thinking of, I was thinking about beetles quite a bit, but, uh, and plants, it was really interesting and eye opening to me that those traits are sort of universal, like you're talking about. And not only do we have a whole bunch of species from Asia or, or the tropics or, or uh, different places on earth, but they also have many species invading there that are from here. So that's something that I've never thought about critically, but it makes a lot of sense when you're talking about those, uh, those traits that are common to those invasions. It's also yeah. pretty interesting. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, I saw a number and, and you may be able to correct me if I don't hit it right, but I think there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 50,000 non-native species in the United States. I, I that think that's probably about right. Yeah. No, that's uh, non-native, right? So that's not yeah, necessarily totally invasive. Um, well, I, yeah, and I was going to make the point that you were just making, uh, I was trying to, I, I've studied wild pigs to some degree, and I was trying to figure out how much of the total economic damage was by that one species, and I seem to remember that it was near 10%. So we have 50,000 non-native species, and we have one that's causing, you know, even if it was a full percent, that was pretty impressive, right? But it kind of goes to what you're saying, it, it really is a handful that come in and wreak havoc thinking, you know, that there are tens of thousands of species that have invaded and are non-native, really only a few of them have really caused big problems. Yeah, it's like, what is that saying? One one bad apple ruins a whole bunch or that type of thing, right? You, you've right. got a whole bunch of these things out there and it's it's usually a very small proportion of them that, that does a lot of the damage, you know, so mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's, 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 and so that's, you know, that, like we said, that's the trick. How do you know what the next really damaging pest is going to be? Uh, we don't know that, you know, and, and to your other point about, you know, we, we get a lot of non-natives and invasives here in North America, especially the U.S., because we import so much stuff. Uh, and, you know, if you look at a map of where does, where does all, where do our imports come from? You know, most things have that little made in China stamp on them, right? We get a ton of stuff from China. It's just a fact of life. Um, if you look at the, you know, especially from the, the southeastern perspective, southeastern U.S., if you look at the forest types and the climate, it is a perfect match to China, right? Mm -hmm. The coastal plain, Piedmont type stuff, a lot of, lot of pine, a lot of oak, uh, upland beach, They've got the same thing over there. It might not be, you know, lot lolly pine and longleaf pine, but it's, you know, they've got other pinus species, they've got other Quercus species. And then the climate is, you know, pretty much the same as well too, right? So when these pests, you know, accidentally get here in some shipment of whatever thing, they come off the boat and they've got the same climate and weather, they've got pretty much the same environment and they have no natural enemies. It's like a, yeah. you know, just go to town, right? And so yeah. they, that's basically what happens is, that, is they just go to town with no natural population checks on them. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, one, one last thing before we go that I, I find to be interesting discussion and you may have an interesting perspective on it. And I think we were kind of touching on it. There, there is a school of thought that you know, that uh, non-native species, the majority of them are actually just 
adding, if you actually measure species richness or, or you know, metric of, of diversity like that, they actually only in, increase it rather than decrease it. And I was just curious if, if you had any thoughts about that argument, because I have heard it before. I have thoughts for sure. Um, <laughs> I, I think that type of um, notion would be extremely situation specific. Right. So, so maybe if you're talking about one guild of things in a certain place, then that I could see maybe non-natives increasing it. But I think on a whole, I just don't see how that's possible. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. And, and that's part of the problem, you know, the, the beauty of being an entomologist. So I was trained as an entomologist is you can, you can work with all these different groups, but it's so hard to work with them all together, which is what we need to do, right? Because these mm -hmm. things don't exist in a vacuum. You don't just have bark and ambrosia beetles out there. You've got all the competitors, you've got all the, the, the predators, you've got all this other stuff. But in some cases, it's extremely difficult to capture them, you know, all these other things. It's nearly impossible to get them all identified to species, which is what you need to do to really get that picture of what's happening at the biodiversity, right? And mm -hmm. I know, you know, in some cases you can take it to the family level or genus level, but I, I think that only works in at a very rough 30,000 foot view, I guess. Mm -hmm. To really know what's happening, I think you got to get to species. And for a lot of these groups, uh, not just of insects, but of a lot of things, we just don't have the taxonomic expertise to do that. And if you do, it takes years, you know, and this gets into, you know, how long are projects and well, they're usually three to four years because that's the funding cycle, right? Mm -hmm. or maybe they're even a year if they're, you know, so what you, what we really need is, a, is, is something or someone or somewhere to put up, uh, put up support for a 20 year biodiversity assessment project where you've got a massive team and you take maybe a few spots and you measure everything because it's all connected. The mm -hmm. bugs, the fungus, the vertebrates, the plants, the microbes, like all that stuff works together. So it's really difficult just getting, when you just have snapshots of things to say X is affecting Y in, in its way. I mean, we can do it to an extent, but for something as, as interconnected and complex as the whole non-native biodiversity thing, it's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. So then I guess circling back to what you what you asked, can non-natives increase biodiversity? Maybe in some cases, you know, especially if they're invading a, an ecosystem that maybe is fairly light on, on diversity in the first place, then maybe they're going to add to it. But if they're going into, if you're getting non-natives into an already very diverse place, I think without seeing the data, your best case scenario is it just, it's a push, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they would increase it. They probably would decrease it just if any of those are invasive, um, or, but it's probably going to be a push. Yeah. So I would have to see the data and I remain skeptical <laughs> until convinced. <Yeah. laughs> that's how I would think. Yeah, that's, that. that's our role as scientists, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And I have heard that before, and there are some some folks that are pushing that that idea, and, and I think it's you know we get in trouble when we paint with broad brush strokes and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's just you know, and we haven't even talked about like aquatic invasives because there's some great examples there with you know the zebra mussels and all that type of thing, the crayfish and all that. Um, it's it's really tricky with the broad brush strokes. You got to have so much empirical data before you can make those those claims. Uh, it just takes a long, long time. I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. Well, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this. It, it was really enlightening. I learned a lot and uh, really thank you for all the work that you're doing and, and uh, taking the time to tell us about it. Happy to do it, Marcus, anytime. All right. Thanks everybody for tuning in.